I couldn't see it while I was live, so I tried to catch a little bit before the uh, before we had uh, the service that we attended was 11 a.m. So I thought, well, we'll just catch the first little bit and get the song service, and I couldn't seem to catch anything, so I don't know what I was doing wrong. Amen. Well, I'm speaking tonight on peace, peace, and um, I want to touch a little bit on on um, mental illness tonight, and I felt the Lord uh, impress this upon me to just extend this series one more uh, lesson because it's an area that's so well uh, mental struggles are so prolific right now it's in everywhere you go in fact I, I dare say it touches every single one of us mm -hmm. where every single one of us is impacted by the craziness of our world say amen, amen. every single one of us is impacted by uh, somebody who is struggling and needs help whether it's um, anxiety uh, depression or confusion just it's it's all around us and so I believe that in the church we need to talk about this I think it's something we need to talk about we talk about it in the world we need to talk about it especially in the church and I mean in the church I mean to the church about what we all face because it will help us a whole lot to know that every single one of us is probably just a step or two away from being mentally ill you know that it's what makes us healthy are the support systems that are in our lives. And that would be family, that would be relationship with God, that would be friends, uh, that would be a job, that would be housing, all of these things. Uh, even our physical health, if we have our physical health, it goes a long way towards helping us to feel better mentally. Amen? Amen. And of course, we know that as Christians, we're not exempt from... Uh, the struggles in the world. We all experience the same type of uh, things that the world does because we're all human. We're all human beings. Some people thought, well, when I, get, what, when I come to the Lord and get into church and they won't ever, I won't ever have to deal with these things that I deal with in, in my family or at work. But you know what? Human beings are there. Human beings are here. And you'll find a certain measure of hypocrisy in the church. Amen. I mean, some of it might save you from being, having your feelings hurt. Do you like my new dress? Well, not really. <laughs> Do you want them to really be honest? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, don't, I think we can be kind and still be honest, right? Amen. 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 You don't have to say everything you think to be, to be honest, right? right. Yeah. You can still be honest and still use a little bit of tact. And anyway, um, I, I read this the other day and it kind of struck me as rather humorous, but it said it's the best ever senior citizen joke, and you probably saw this, but I said, I'm going to share it. Maybe somebody needs to laugh tonight. A little silver-haired lady calls her neighbor and says, please come here and help me. I have a killer jigsaw puzzle, and I can't figure out how to get started. Her neighbor asks, uh, what is it supposed to be when it's finished? The little silver-haired lady said, according to the picture on the box, it's a rooster. Her neighbor decides to go over and help her with the puzzle. She lets him in and shows him where she has the puzzle spread all over the table. He studies the pieces for a moment. Then he looks at the box. Then he turns to her and he says, first of all, no matter what we do, we're not going to be able to assemble these pieces into anything remotely resembling the rooster. He takes her hand and says, secondly, I want you to relax. Let's have a nice cup of tea. And then he said with a deep sigh, Let's put all the cornflakes back in the box. <laughs> I don't know what your challenges are today. But hopefully it's not that bad. 
But sometimes our lives are very much like this dear little old sister. We are trying to put the cornflake pieces of our lives together to, to come to make some sense and we just can't figure it out. And maybe we need somebody to just take us by the hand and say, look, just relax, come with me, and let's, uh, let's not worry about that. You don't have to get it all together. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to get it all together. That's the great thing about serving the Lord, is that we don't have to have it all together. We are complete in Him, who is the head of all power and principality. And if we can keep our eyes on the Lord, a lot of things are going to take care of themselves. I remember a story, and I've probably shared this a hundred times here, but I'll share it again because I like to repeat myself. This little boy was bothering his dad. He was trying to get some work done. His dad was, and the little boy kept interrupting him. So he took a piece out of the magazine, and it was a picture, um, and, and he tore it up into pieces. He said, here, put this together. Here's some scotch tape. The boy was back in five minutes, pestering dad again, like little boys sometimes do. And he said, Dad, he said, he said, son, he said, how are you able to get that, those pieces all back together? He said, it was simple, Dad. I noticed when you tore the picture out that on the back side of that page was a picture of a man's face. I flipped all the pieces over, and when I got the man's face all together, he said, it was it simple. And you know what? When we can keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. when he can be the center of our focus, what... A wonderful thing because you're looking at the Prince of Peace and so it's not necessary for you to solve every problem in your life or have all the answers for this one or that one but really just to hold on to Jesus Christ for the Bible says holding on to him who is the head hold on to the head because if you can hold on to him I'll tell you what he's not going to fall apart and he's going to help you hold together amen well, I want us to, to turn our attention to Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 2 to 4. Because believe it or not, the Bible has lots to say about our mental health and our spiritual health. And I believe that the two are really uh, intertwined. In fact, I believe that um, the times that we struggle with our mental health or our emotional health, really the root issue is our spiritual health. I love this chapter. I don't know how many times I've said that. This is one of my favorite verses, but it really is. Isaiah chapter 26, and we'll start with verse 2. That's not my favorite, though. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Now, here's my favorite, one of my favorites. Verse 3 of Isaiah 26. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the or focused on thee because he trusted in thee. Oh, what a beautiful promise! Not just peace, but perfect peace. Again, let me reiterate that the Bible is not telling us that all is well in every area because verse 4 says, Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. When you tell somebody to trust in the Lord, what you're really telling them is that your problem's not too big for God. You're acknowledging that God is big enough for the situation, but you're also acknowledging that there is a situation. I'm not going to say trust in the Lord if everything's going well in your life. Hopefully you're going to trust in the Lord that it will continue to be well and, and to be blessed. But the very fact that we are commanded in the scriptures to trust in the Lord indicates that we do have challenges. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you are a challenge. No. <laughs> you have challenges. And I'm going to look at myself right here in the reflection of my iPad and say, you are a challenge, Pastor. You have challenges and you are a challenge. Amen. Every single one of us. Somebody said, I'd love to go to a church without problems. Well, there won't be any people there. Because every single one of us has a challenge. Every single one of us has an issue somewhere. But God has promised if we will keep him the focus that he will give us not only peace, but perfect peace. I tell you, I enjoy perfect peace. I'm not saying it's never challenged. It may have been challenged the last couple days, but still there is a peace. And I believe that the, one of the most attractive things about a Christian is this perfect peace. A friend of mine was a... Well, as the Indian fellow said, he was learning English. 
And he said, when I was in the world, he said, I was a, I was a terrible sinner. He said, I was, I was a bad sinner. In fact, he said, I was an excellent sinner. That was his testimony. I was an excellent sinner. He, he was trying to use every English word he could to describe. I was an excellent sinner. Well, some of us. But this friend of mine was an excellent sinner. He was a drug consumer and a drug dealer. He knew the connections between St. John, where he lived, and Toronto, Montreal, all the big connections. He was in on it. He told me uh, that before he met Christ, he said, I emptied a revolver on the guy's head one time. He wasn't bragging, but he was a mess. He was a mess. And one of his, one of his buddies, one of his uh, friends that was involved in the drug trade came to know the Lord. And he said, I argued with him. I argued with them. I think this is crazy. There's nothing to this. Because, I mean, my friend, he grew up in a church. He didn't really know the Lord, but he had had some background in the church. But he said, the thing, I, I argued with him, but he said, the thing that, that stuck with me, he said, was the look of peace in his eyes. The peace of God convinced my friend Mac that this was real. And who knows, but what you are experiencing in your life, you may even be going through some stuff like what Joe did, but, the, but your integrity, your faithfulness to God, your, your commitment that though he slay me, I'm going to trust him. The peace of God in your life is a powerful testimony to others that are watching you. They know what you're going through. Your neighbors know a whole lot more than what you realize. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a fact. They know a lot about, a, 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 they probably know more about you than you know, sometimes. But the peace of God, it's a wonderful thing. Not only does it give you a powerful testimony, but it just makes living for God so much greater, amen? Hallelujah. That will keep him in perfect peace, perfect peace. Do you suppose this is an automatic thing? I don't think that's what the scripture is saying. Now we preached last week that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. But again, the order of God must be in our lives. We must love the Lord with all our heart and do our best to try to love everybody around about us. And, and that's the right thing. That's the righteousness of God. It's, the Bible says that all the commandments of God are, hang upon this one thought. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said if you can do that, you will really cover all the bases for all the commandments of God. So righteousness, the Bible says, is the first thing in the kingdom of God, followed by peace. So being in order, being righteous brings peace, and then peace brings joy. So it's not automatic. He says, you've got to keep your life in priority, right? Amen. You've got to read your Bible every day. You've got to pray every day. If I don't read my Bible one day, I know the difference. If I don't read my Bible and pray two days, my family knows the difference. But the third day, the world knows because old stuff starts creeping back into your life and mine. Amen. We've got to do these. These are the right things. We, we need to be in church. We need to be in the house of the Lord. Unless we're sick or, you know, we've got there's Sometimes we have a reason. And I appreciate One thing I really appreciate about this church is you folks are so good at communicating if you can't be here. So pastor doesn't have to worry. That helps my peace. If you're sick, I want to know so I can come visit you or call you or whatever. If you're discouraged, I need to know that. Amen. I thank God. We hardly ever see people get discouraged. If you, you notice, we don't, once in a while we have a little discouraging circumstance, but I don't really see people getting terribly discouraged. I'll tell you why. Because when we get to church, we make up for the week. Amen? Amen. We get what we come for. Yeah. We're going to praise God. We're going to shout hallelujah. We're going to get something from the Word of God. Amen? Amen? And I'll tell you what, having good services goes a long ways to keeping you in victory. I mean, it's not going to replace your Bible reading and prayers. It's not going to replace your, de your devotions and your commitment to God. But it will certainly augment and lift it to a higher level. Amen? And it is a place where if all of us are paddling our boats and reading our Bibles and praying and trying to be close to God, we've got some spiritual momentum. We come together. We're not just dragging the life out of one another. We are intensifying one another's uh, walk with God. We're adding something. You can feel the energy in this place. Amen? Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. And I'll tell you what, the Word of God, the Word of God is uh, preached from a pulpit. It, it, can, it can really make a huge difference. I wanted to share something with you. Um, I, I was actually going to start my message off of this tonight. Uh, if you've got a pen and paper, jot this down. If not, um, listen to it again. But 
I just want to share this with you. It's a little sideline, but... Uh, to receive from the preaching of the word, there are four things that will enable you to receive more from God, okay? Number one, listen carefully. Oh, pastor, sometimes my mind wanders. Sometimes my mind wanders too. That's why I try to, I try to keep things interesting as I can. But listen carefully. Number two, respond enthusiastically. It opens your spirit up to absorb. When you say amen, that is saying something. That's telling everybody here, I believe what he's saying. He's saying something good. You are energizing the preacher. You are energizing the crowd of people. But you are also energizing yourself because the Bible says all the promises of God are yea and amen. There's something about our response to the promises of God's word. When you respond, amen. Ever try to have a one-way conversation with somebody? Now, I don't mean the kind of person that, that uh, they talk so much that you can't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> but I'm talking about the kind of conversations where they won't say anything. They won't respond. It is so awkward. Especially if you're kind of a quiet and shy person yourself. Some of us, we can talk. It wouldn't matter if you answered or not. That's probably why I'm up, I'm up here preaching tonight. I have a gift. Amen. When I was younger, I was worse. But, you know, when you're talking to somebody who doesn't carry their end of the conversation, it's like, how can I get out of here? Have you ever been there? Yeah, yeah it's like, what do I say? Yeah. Anyway, respond enthusiastically to the Word of God. It helps you, your spirit to absorb. So number one, listen carefully. Number two, respond enthusiastically. It opens up your spirit to absorb. Number three, take notes. All right. You say, well, I can't respond and praise the Lord. Sure you can. You can still, Christ does it. James, say amen, brother. Amen. He's making some notes. Take notes. Oh, it's great. You'll be surprised when you read over that again. Especially you go back like a, a month or two and read some of the notes. And oh, wow, that is so good. And jot down that scripture reference. Amen. Just review. And number four, review and apply. Reread your notes or rewatch the video if you've got a computer. Uh, pray that God will help you to apply it to your life so that you will be changed. Even if it's just a little change that you're bringing about in your life. Amen? Yes. So let's see if we, how much we remember. Let's see how well you listen. Number one. Seriously. Number two. Yes. All right. Number three. Yes. Number four. Yes. Review and apply. You can, sure you can. You, you've already written it down. All right. Very good. All right. And you just never know. Like, I'll tell you, it's, it's great. My wife likes to take notes as well. And uh, I don't know if she does still or, or not. Or maybe she hears enough of me through the week. She doesn't have to. <laughs> maybe she knows what I'm going to say. But, uh, you know, sometimes you go back through the old notes. And, oh, wow, that was so good. And how many know that that can encourage you? Yes. And you got to cause you just, your eyes to fall upon that which you need. Amen. Yeah. All right. Now, let's look in our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Another really familiar passage of Scripture, and it ties into peace. But it starts off with um, uh, making your body a living sacrifice. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. That's something we need to do every day. God, I give you my mind. I give you my body. I give you my heart. Uh, just fill me, flow through me, guide me, direct me. How many know that you don't have to be hit by a thunderbolt to be directed by the Lord? Yeah. I have the Lord just nudge me, little things here and there, and I'm beginning to become aware that uh, it's not just my memory prompting me, but it's God prompting my memory. Yes. Yeah. That God actually is... You know, I, I couldn't tell you the, the many, many times that God has spoken to me uh, and encouraged me to do something afterwards. I thought, wow, the timing of that. What's the chance that I would have thought this up? I didn't know what was going to happen following that. But I'm telling you, God is guiding you and directing you. But the scripture tells us in Job, and I can't remember where the passage is, but basically God will open up your mind when you're sleeping and he'll put a thought in there. Have you ever said, well, I'll sleep on it? Well, that's what the scripture says. Sleep on it. Don't worry about it. So say, all right, God, I prayed about it. I give it to you. And just show me what I'm to do. And maybe I'll wake up in the morning. God will give me. I'm telling you, God does it to me all the time. Most of my really good messages come in the middle of the night or the morning. God will wake me up. And I just grab my phone and I start. 
making notes. My wife said, what are you doing? <laughs> said, I got a message from the Lord. She's, yeah. She can wake up quite easily. So anyway, I, I write them down. I have learned to take advantage of them. But you know, if you pray, God direct me, God lead me, you need to believe that he is. Right. Don't be second guessing yourself. I mean, if your attitude is right, if you're doing your best to be an all right person, get along with other people, God's going to show you what to do. And if he hasn't right now, he will show you when you need to know. Right. Amen. Maybe he doesn't want you to be stewing and worrying too much. Some of the things God wants me to do, he just shows me right before I have to do it. Because if I thought too much about it, I know I'd mess it up. I just get myself too keyed up. You know? And sometimes we just need to relax and flow. Let the spirit of the Lord blow into your sails. You lift your sails up through prayer to the Lord and say, oh God, you just blow yeah. upon my life and direct me where you want me to go. What you want me to say, what you want me to do, how you want me to handle this, and have a confidence in your heart, because God can direct you so much better if you will just have a faith in your heart and be relaxed. Yeah. It'll come out the right way. I tell you, if you get all tense, how many know that many times we get tense that it, kind of, it just does not come out right? You need to learn to rest in the Lord. Let God drive the boat of your life. Let him blow into your sails and direct you. Just trust in him and he will. The Bible says the holy men of God wrote down the scriptures as God moved upon them. It was like a picture of a wind and a sail. The spirit, the word spirit literally in the original, if you look it up, it says wind or breath. Perfect description of God. He's invisible, but when he starts moving, you feel him. And you see all the effects of his spirit moving just like you do with the wind. You know, we're breathing right now, right? We're breathing in the air. It's We hardly ever thought of it until I mentioned it, but we were taking in the essence of the air. Well, God is moving upon your life. And so he's blowing into your sails. He's directing you. You're not here by, you don't make as many decisions as you think you do. <laughs> God's guiding your life. Yes, you make decisions. Yes, you do have responsibility to make good decisions. I'm not saying that, but what I'm telling you is that many times God is directing us and we don't even realize it. And that should bring you peace. You give yourself as a living sacrifice. Uh, the Bible says that he will direct you. He will, he will help you prove what is the perfect will of God. If you'll give yourself to him, if you'll commit yourself, God says, I'll do the directing. You just present yourself. You do the presenting. I'll do the directing. All right, listen. Be not conformed to this world. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed now by the renewing of your mind. Let God renew your mind. Yeah. I mean, if you get a thought and it's not, it's not right, uh, it doesn't have to be a bad thought, but it just be a wrong thought. Maybe, maybe you feel upset about something and God says, you know what? It's not really worth it for you to get upset. God says, let me renew your mind. Right. Think about the good things I'm doing. Amen. I'll tell you what. Let God renew your mind and that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And nothing will give you peace like knowing that you are in the will of God. So how do I know when I'm in the will of God? Well, just get out of the will of God. You'll find out. <laughs> Have you been out of the will of God before? <laughs> the Bible says let the peace of God rule in your hearts. The peace of God is probably the most powerful indicator that we are in the will of God. Jesus was in the boat. The storm was blowing all around. Jesus steps to the bow of the ship, I'm assuming. And he says, peace, be still. And there is peace. There was a storm, but he brings the peace. They were in the will of God. The peace will come. If you're not feeling it tonight, you pray. Say, God, I want to experience your perfect peace. Yeah. Start praying into that. You could pray specifically. God will answer specifically. You know, I, I don't think God wants us just to let him do all the work. We have to we have to present it to the Lord. Amen. Lord, I tend to struggle with fear. I tend to get frustrated easily when things don't work out. I want it to happen yesterday. When it doesn't, I get frustrated. You get frustrated easily maybe with things because you want to get things done. And you're just a, you're just a production facility. You know, you got to get things done. Got to get it behind there. Right? Kick it out in the street. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe that causes you to be a little impatient. Well, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Everybody say love. love. Joy. joy. Well, if you, whatever you do, try to at least enjoy it, right? Mm -hmm. Even your job. Everybody say amen. amen. Try to do it. I said try. Love, joy, peace. Peace follows joy. And what follows peace? Long suffering, which is literally translated patience. Mm -hmm. So the patience comes because of peace. So keep an eye on your, your spiritual temperature. Keep, it, keep your finger on the pulse. Am I feeling the peace of God? 
If not, just start thanking God for all the good things. Thank God for his provision. Thank you for your health and strength. Thank you for your friends. Thank you for your church. Thank you for your pastor. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank God for your friends. Isn't it great to have Christian friends? Isn't it great to have a prayer partner? We can talk about that a little bit later, too. Have a prayer partner. You need a prayer partner. All right. They don't everybody pick my wife or she'll be overwhelmed. Pray for me. But she might be one of your prayer partners. Who knows? All right. So you will, uh, the Bible says, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God as God renews your mind. And I tell you, the peace of God is a good indicator of the will of God. Again, the storm can be blowing around you, but you can go through it with the peace. And you know, you've seen us, uh, your, your pastor and your pastor's wife, go through things with the peace of God. Amen. 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 Um, let us turn to uh, the same, same chapter, chapter 12, but I want to um, look at verse 14. Bless them which persecute you. Do you think that will affect your peace? Mm. Bless and curse not. Don't criticize. Don't criticize. Don't condemn. Just love people. A book that absolutely changed my life next to the Bible was Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It was chock full of scriptures. But Dale Carnegie is a... Um, is uh, like a PR type of a man. He's not living now, but once upon a time, he wrote several books, and the books are really good. You know, I think every Christian, every leader especially, should read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is powerful. It's life-changing. But one of the things that he taught in this course, and I know this lady that she struggled for years, and I don't mean she was heavy. I mean, she was like, she was really, really, she really, really had uh, some issues and it wasn't what she was eating it was what was eating her say amen anyway and i saw her it'd been probably months i saw her again and she had lost this weight and uh i thought wow what's what's happening here you know what happened she took the dale carnegie course in st john and one of the things that was emphasizing that is do not criticize complain or condemn and she started practicing those three things, and her whole life was transformed. Not only that, she was in her 30s, and God, you know, she wanted to be married, wanted to have a husband. And you know what happened is the best looking guy in the church married her. I'm talking like a movie star, greatest personality. I'm telling you, but I don't think any of that would have ever happened had she not had the transformation of the inside and come to a place of peace with herself and with the Lord. Amen. How many of that when we're happy inside, it affects everything. It also creates a magnet that draws happiness into your life. And so you create, uh, your relationship with the Lord creates an energy that you exude that literally opens up opportunities and brings relationships to come to pass in your life. Amen. It's true. They don't criticize. If you get if you get criticized, I remember this was a young lady at, 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 at Bible college, and a lot of the girls were jealous of her. She came from a family of singers, and I, I guess I guess they meant this as a real insult to her. But she had really skinny legs. I don't know if you should talk about this from the pulpit, but anyway, she was a friend of mine, and she said, you know, some girls will say to me, she said, "Your legs are so skinny," and um, uh, her mother told her, she said. Just tell them, well, thank you very much. They meant it in criticism, but she learned how to respond in a way that deflected the criticism and took it as a compliment. Well, thank you very much. And that stuck with me because I thought, what, what a great way to diffuse your critic. It's just a thank, thank, thank you for that. I hope that I can improve, you know, in that area. I hope that I can, you know, because I want to be a better Christian. You know, and I thank you for the courage it took to, you know, you will just totally knock the wind out of their sails. Amen. How many know that you can diffuse a situation? You really can. Or you can be like a spark to the gasoline, too. Yeah, you could be a spark to the gasoline. And I don't know who's to blame in that situation, the gasoline or the spark. 
But an explosion requires both. So really, I mean, I suppose we think what the spark is just one little spark, but that's all it takes. Amen. And you and I can diffuse situations. Amen. Can I just share something from my life? I'm a very positive individual. I think I'm pretty embracing. I accept people. Like, but when I was younger, I, I had some baggage I carried around. And one time, <laughs> one time, there was something my wife said, and I got offended by it. My, and her sister was there, my sister-in-law. And um, very, very nice person, very, very kind and diplomatic person. But she told me, she said, you tend to take things the wrong way. You know what the problem was? It was not what my wife was saying. It was not that she lacked sensitivity. It's that I was overly sensitive. And, and, and because I was insecure, I was taking it the wrong way. You know, sometimes it's not the other person being critical. Maybe it's just how we respond to it. Well, it kind of hurt my feelings, but it's definitely made an impression upon me. Obviously, it helped me because I've really, really changed and I worked on trying not to be super sensitive. You may be married to somebody that's super sensitive. You may be, you may be the super sensitive one yourself. It may be, you know, God blesses us with sensitivity. I don't think that that's a curse to be super sensitive. I think it can be a very positive thing as long as it's not all wrapped up in me or it's not all wrapped up in you. If we, if we turn our sensitivity outward and use it to help other people instead of being overly sensitive, amen? Well, if you went through what I went through, you would, oh, well, we've all gone through stuff in our background. We've all been, we've all had stuff that's hurt us, that's happened, that's made us uh, extra sensitive. And I'll tell you what, when you're going through something, how many know that if you're struggling with something, you're always going to be a little bit more sensitive? It's only natural. How, what does that have to do with peace, Pastor? Everything, absolutely. Because you and I have to realize that if we are a sensitive person, that's a gift from God. But we also need to learn how to use that in a positive way. Amen. I think it makes me sensitive to the Spirit of God. But it also makes me sensitive to getting my feelings hurt. And it also makes me sensitive to the spiritual realm. Some people just go right on through the devil, never bothers them because they're just so numb they never recognize them. <laughs> but I'm sensitive. I recognize him. And so sometimes he can, he, can, he can play on me because of that. But I just focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in control. He's in charge. And I don't let the devil have much of my attention at all. But see, that's one of the things. If you're a sensitive person, you will become more aware of spiritual warfare. You'll notice it. You'll pick things up. And sometimes uh, just because you see something doesn't mean that God necessarily wants you to say or do anything. He just may want you to pray. That was one of the things I had to learn is just because I see something doesn't mean I necessarily have to address it. There's a kind of a way you could use a backdoor approach and just encourage that person in a totally different way and not necessarily have to. Because sometimes when we draw attention to an issue, we almost make it worse. It's like the child that's a little bit shy. And Johnny, you know, and I, I know like we've had, we've, our four kids are all four of them are so different, but Alana used to be a little bit shy when she was younger. We had to kind of push her. But the worst thing you could do with a kid, and I hope you don't do this if your kid is shy, but, but um, is to say, oh, they're so shy. Because what you're doing is you're impressing that upon their mind that they're shy. It is helping to create their image. So what we tried to do was never use that word, but just kind of push them a little bit. Say, you can do it. You can do it. And give them opportunities to build their confidence, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Is this, will this help anybody here tonight? Amen. Amen. All right, let's get back to the scriptures here. I'm definitely down a bunny trail here. Ten minutes ago. All right. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Just treat everybody with no partiality. Mind not high things. But condescend to men of low estates. You know what I really respect in a person, especially a great leader, is when I see them taking time for those who are quite often overlooked. If there's anything that will win my respect in a person, in a human being, but especially in a leader, it's when they take the time for the little people. 
like the little senior who's losing the memory or the little person, the person who just doesn't fit in because some people think they're odd, but really they're just unique. They're special and we're all special. But when we take that time and we show special concern or love and that person in the youth group that doesn't quite fit in, when you go and you include them, say, hey, come sit with us. I'm telling you something. You are great in God's eyes. My not high things. I, and, and you know what really irks me is the people that just got to get around the special, the who's who's and the VIPs. Just to show that they're something special. They're really insecure and they're trying to make themselves feel better by hobnobbing with people. I, I think it's great that if you, could, if you could be yourself with the Queen of England, that's great. Doctors, lawyers in town. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable around anybody. I don't care if a movie star walked in here or a politician. Uh, they just need to be treated like a human being and given the same respect that you all deserve. I mean, they're no more special to me than anybody else. In fact, you know, one of the things I, I maybe it wasn't wise of me, but when I first took the church as your pastor, came here, one of the things I, I was always aware of the numbers, attendance, and the offerings in general, because I wanted to know that we were growing numerically, growing financially, growing spiritually, and you can measure some things. It does tell a lot about morale. Uh, but one of the things I never did was check to see how much people were giving because I didn't want to know who was the biggest tithe payer and who wasn't. In fact, I found out that there's some that don't, don't support the church. And I don't know that there's anybody here. I don't know. <laughs> Again, it's not something I look at very often, but sometimes I have to. Okay. But um, I want to treat you all the same. Because Jesus said the little widow that cast in the two pence cast in more than all those rich folk that went on before. Because she was faithful and gave, she probably gave above what she needed to give. And what I've found is that sometimes the people that are the most faithful are those, um, but everybody here has been, been, I think our church is commendable in faithfulness. So I'm not saying that with any ulterior motive at all. I just appreciate that our church is faithful to the Lord. And I know if we're faithful to the Lord, we're going to go in the rapture. Amen. Because those that they are and the armies of heaven that follow Jesus are the called, the chosen, and the faithful, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna go to heaven, you've got to be faithful. Amen. And, and I'll tell you, we need to teach our children from the time they're really young. You need to be in the house of the Lord. You need to give your talent to the Lord, and you need to give of your treasure. That 10% belongs to God. It never was yours, it belongs to God. Amen. And if 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 I do that, then I'll teach my children to do that. Amen. And uh and that's very important. But if you don't do it, you'll never pass it on to your children. And if you look back, it's probably a generational thing of not being faithful. Amen. Mm -hmm. But people that are faithful tend to tend to uh, reproduce people that are faithful. Those that we influence, those that are uh, that we bring into this world, are going to be the offspring of us, not just physically but spiritually. Amen. So be faithful, you know, and, and check it. Make sure that in all the areas that you've got the boxes ticked off, amen? Not to tick off the boxes, but you're just showing your love for God, amen? amen. Praise the Lord. And I do appreciate the faithfulness of God's people. That'll go a long ways to giving you peace. Amen. Well, God, I've got a financial need, but you know, Lord, I've always put you first. God, this is your problem. You're going to take care of it. How many know that God will take care of it? Amen. You'll get a little surprise in the mailbox. Amen. amen. Because you've been faithful to God. I'll tell you what, make him number one. Yeah, be a man of God, be a woman of God. And you're never too young. You can start at eight years old when you mow lawns, being faithful to the Lord. That will bring the peace of God. Um, treat one another with respect in the church. I don't care how they treat you. You treat them with respect. People are going to find out for sure. You know what? Other people, let other people take care of things. <laughs> I've found that other people can do a much better job. You just trust in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Recompense to no man evil for evil. This is good preaching tonight, isn't it? Amen. Not because I'm doing it. <laughs> Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, look at verse 18. If it be possible, as much as life in you live peaceably with all men. If it's within your power, whatever is within your power, live peaceably with all men. Now, it's not always possible. Some people like to fight. I found out that some people like to fight. You got any fighters here? I like to fight the devil, but amen. I don't want to fight. I, the servant of the Lord must not strive. If you've got to fight and push a bully to get your way, oh my goodness. 
You're just a weak person, amen? Because if you treat people with respect, you're going to get a lot of what you want in life, amen? It's a whole lot easier to attract bees with honey than it is with vinegar, right? Amen. Hallelujah. I want to tell you something tonight. Life is worth living. I don't care what you're facing, it's still worth living. Even though it may not always be easy. Corey Ten Boom, she went through the Second World War, they hid Jews, then they got, they got caught, they got sent away to prison, and she suffered, her sister suffered a lot, but uh, she shared this little poem. She said, and it's written by Benjamin Malachi Franklin, but some people give her credit for it, but it's because she's famous, and she quoted it. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors. He weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. The dark threads are as needed in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. See, when you look at that tapestry, if you look at the back side of it, it just looks like a tangled mess. There's no sense. There's no beauty. There's no order. It just looks like it's confusion. But when you flip it over on the other side, the master weaver has a design that is so beautiful. And many times when God is working in our lives, we don't see what he's doing. But we can trust that he's doing something good. Yes. We can trust that there is a pattern. There is a plan. And there's beauty. The scripture says, and if you're patient and wait on the Lord, you will find that he makes everything beautiful in his time. In his time. There is a perfect time. Amen. Encourage one another. That's so important in the church, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, another thing, prayer is a great stress reliever. Prayer is a great, and you can pray anywhere. And you don't have to pray a 10-minute long prayer. You can pray a five-second prayer. And God will hear that just as much as he will, a 10-minute prayer. Amen. And hopefully you'll pray a little bit more than five seconds. Because that sounds, it kind of sounds a little bit like, a, you know, like the sermon, what did you promise God when you were in trouble? Oh, God, I know. But there's a problem and I need you, Lord. So I'm looking to you. And number two, have a prayer partner. Have a prayer partner. The Bible says two are better than one. Because if one falls, the other will lift him up. God designed us for fellowship. And I believe that's why he said, uh, if any two or three agree on earth is touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. The prayer of agreement, having a prayer partner. Corporate prayer is important. When we pray, to, and, and uh, usually on Saturday nights we try to do our practice, we try to have a prayer, corporate prayer on Saturday night, and then Friday or Sunday night at 5.30, we have corporate prayer. Try to come early for prayer. Amen? Amen? Write that down. Respond to that, apply that, and review that, come for prayer. I mean, the Bible says when they prayed, the place was shaken and they were filled with boldness. And the courage came then. Courage came. Amen. I just read this. I want to share the story in closing. Uh, this is Brother Fred Child. Um, he's a pastor in our organization. And he said that his pastor, Marvin Cole, said, years ago my pastor, Marvin Cole in Beaumont, I think that's Beaumont, Texas, was visited by some rich-looking men. Uh, they said he was chosen. They said he knew, they said they knew that he could reach many. They offered to build him the biggest facility on the best property in town, full media, everything free. He would never want for finances. No limit on funds. He could grow as big as he wanted to. They said he could preach his gospel, but also he had to let others come even if they didn't fully embrace one God, Jesus' name, and the essentiality of the Holy Ghost. He refused. In fact, he rebuked them, and they left angry, saying, you don't know what you have turned down. You should have accepted our offer. Within a week 
a hired assassin got into the passenger side of this pastor's car and pointed a pistol at him. And he said, before I kill you, I am to tell you, you should have accepted their offer. Brother Cole said, Jesus. And the man's hand began to shake. He could not squeeze the trigger. He tried, but his finger could not squeeze. Brother Cole began to rebuke him and the man fled in terror. Amen. I want to tell you something. You've got a pretty big God on your side. And if anybody messes with you, they're messing with Jesus. And I want to tell you something, that God's going to take care of his own. I'm not saying he'll never let us be persecuted. I'm not saying he'll never uh, let some of us die for the name of Jesus because that's happened all through the centuries of time. But I want to tell you something. If God's not through with you, the devil can't kill you. Right. Yeah. Amen. And I believe that God is getting ready to pour his spirit out upon this church, upon this county, upon our district in a way which we've never seen before that will eclipse the olden days. And there will be God's power and God's confidence the people of God will be confident and we will have tremendous peace. The Bible says, Isaiah 32, 15 and 17, let's stand together. Isaiah 32, 15, until the spirit be poured upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. In other words, fruitfulness is going to come. It's going to be exponential. It's going to multiply. Yeah. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. And the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever God pours out his spirit God brings things into order God begins to bless fruitfulness takes over uh, the wilderness becomes a, a fruitful field the fruitful field becomes a forest amen I just believe that God's into multiplying things amen I don't think we've got the be all and the end all. I think we're just scratching the surface. We're just beginning to see what God is going to do. Amen. God's pouring it out. And God's going to line our lives up. I'm not saying you're not going to change. You're going to change. I'm going to change. The work of righteousness and the result of God changing us is going to bring about peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and insurance forever. Listen, I don't think that Jesus is going to come back for a church that's shaking in her boots. I believe we're going to be a bold aggressive, spiritually assertive church, amen, uh, seeing the promises of God, amen. Oh yeah, there may be a sifting, there may be some people fall aside that are not sincere. But I want to tell you something, there's going to be a multitude in the church and it's going to be strong, it's going to be on fire. God's not coming back for a, a whistled, uh, uh, elderly, crippled uh, bride. No, 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 he's coming back for a bride that's full of uh, energy and strength and beauty Amen. Amen. A, a church that is reproducing spiritually. Amen. God's coming back for a church that is a beautiful church. Hallelujah. And we're privileged to be in that. Now I want to tell you something. Regardless of what problems we may face, God's got a plan and, and it's better than your plan. And it's, it is, I'm telling you, you're going to give God glory. You might as well stop praising him right now. You might as well start just enjoying the peace of God now because he's going to step onto the bow of your ship and your storm and he's going to speak peace be still. And he's going to use your life as a powerful testimony to others. Uh, this, is, this is how my church reacts to problems. They know that I'm the master of the wind. They know that I'm in control. They know that I'm still God, the mighty God. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm in charge. I'm in control. I've never lost a battle. Look at my church. Look at the peace of God in my church. I want to tell you, I want to be a testimony for the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, God, for your presence. Thank you for your wonderful people. Thank you for encouraging us. Lord, help us to review this and meditate upon it. Apply it to our lives. And if anybody, Lord, is struggling and needs the peace of God, I speak the peace of God into their lives right now. I speak the perfect peace, Lord. Bring your order, oh God. Hallelujah. Help them, Lord, not to look at the underside of the tapestry. Help them, oh God, to see it from your vantage point. What you see, oh God, what you are doing, Lord. May they have faith in you, Lord, and trust in you with all their hearts. Hallelujah. For in you, Lord, is everlasting strength, and in you is perfect peace. Let our eyes be fixed and focused on you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. God bless you tonight.